My riches are within my spirit, my mind and my heart, my soul, my body never falling apart. My riches is full of religion, confidence and determination, power, love, and most of all education. Riches to riches. My riches versus your riches. Let's see. Being warm or being hot, having a job of selling drugs, being smart or being shot, giving hugs or developing bugs. Riches to riches. My riches versus your riches. My riches are blessings, compassion, heaven and doing well. Your riches are pain, sorrow and going to hell. Now fast money, more money. That's all people know. And some drug dealers do have feelings they're just scared to let it show. We got kids on corners trying to get money doing whatever they do when they don't even know how to read or to answer the two plus two. Riches to riches. My riches versus your riches. Peace or animosity. Love or poverty. You may say you have riches, but tell me this. What kind? Because I know your riches can't compare to mine. I'm loved, protected, and saved. My faith is something I won't lose. My riches to your riches. Riches to riches. Which one will you choose? All right, awesome. Hey guys, welcome to Giant Nomad Presents. That was maybe, I won't, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself though. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Shanae. I am COE the artist on Instagram. Yes. So how have you been? I'm good. I can't complain. How are you? I'm doing I'm doing good. It's Sunday. I did not realize that the time changed. It did. Um, <laughs> found out when I went to the kitchen and my stove was telling me a different time. <laughs> it did change. <laughs> yeah. so, so that messed me up. I had to rush a little bit. I was like, oh man, I got something at one o'clock I gotta do. <laughs> so it was it was hilarious. But um okay. I got everybody out the way. All the kids are fed, wife is fed, she's tucked in still, so she's good to go. I love so, it. I love yeah. it. It's a rest day. Because after this interview, homie is laying back on his bed, okay? You know what? The same same here. <laughs> same here. <laughs> So I, I want you to, to to tell people a little bit about yourself. I know you write poetry. Yes, I am a spoken word artist. Which is fantastic. Like I've I've, I've been writing since I was thirteen. Okay. And I wrote two books last year. Yeah. I haven't wrote, a, haven't wrote a poetry book. Okay. And I'm doing an urban love story coming oh. up uh, called Brooklyn Love. I'm originally from New York. I live in Atlanta though. I see the the NY hat. Yeah, I'm from Brooklyn, but I live in Atlanta. Heavy, heavy. Yeah. I actually have my in-laws. They live in Charlotte. Oh, okay. So I'm always back and forth into North Carolina a lot. But um, we're, we're in Durham. You're in Durham, yes. Yeah. So that's it's not, it's not too close, but it's not too far either. Right. Okay. <laughs> so so give me some backstory. Like, how did you get into writing poetry? Like, what what brought that up? So um, my first book is called Vent: The Different Faces of Me, and uh, I wrote I wrote that uh. Well, first, let me just say that I put my very first poem in the introduction of Vent the Different Faces of Me. When I was 11, um, my cousin Chad Alexander was killed in North Philly. And um, Chad was like a brother to me. So, like, he taught me how to dribble the ball. I've been playing basketball since I was five. So he taught me how to dribble the ball. And um, and so when he was killed, it took a toll on me. And um, I found an outlet by writing poetry because I had written my first poem about him. And from writing poetry, um, I I understand I understood that I kind of had a gift and an outlet all in one. Um, it was easier for me to let my my emotions and my feelings go. Um, I when I was a, a teenager, I had a bad temper. Like even now, I have a bad temper. So poetry keeps me from doing things that people with bad tempers would normally do. Right. So, like, when I was a teenager, I would throw things or I would yell and scream. And poetry kind of kept me centered. So that's why I love writing. And, you know, with the, the tragedy like that, did you write before the tragedy or did that just did that bring it up? Did that like surface it? Um, I used to write songs and I know songs are poetry. Um, so I was so before he was killed, I was a singer. So I was one of those kids who me and my cousins had a little girl group and we were going to go <laughs> to the studio and we we aspired to be like you know Destiny's Child and so <laughs> I was Latavia the original <laughs> member of Destiny's Child like we had picked we picked when there was four members yeah right like we picked <laughs> who the members would be and I personally was Latavia I had picked her so you know um so I was writing our songs and I had written about 30 songs with like a hook and 
like I didn't understand bridges and you know all that stuff. I just knew there was a chorus, there were verses. So I did I did that, and then once once he was killed, I kind of went into just writing just regular poetry, and then. By the time I was about 14, I had done my first poem in church and I realized I actually like to do poetry in front of people. So then I just kept doing it. And after a while, it turned from just doing poetry for my family and close friends to loving to do spoken word on stage. No, that's amazing because I think that's that's I think that's a genre where it gets missed a lot. Mm -hmm. Right. That Mm -hmm. even in school, depending unless you have a proper teacher or educator that's right. into poetry right. they really don't introduce poetry to people right you know? uh, somebody told me that we're in a like a new renaissance now right. like this is a, a more modern renaissance time where we're bringing um some of the traditions and the the things that they used to do back in you know the 50s and 60s in terms of the arts we're bringing that back now into the millennium which i think is really cool no, absolutely. I think I think that's something that that needs to be said, right? Because um, poetry is, like you said, spoken word is amazing. Yeah. You know, it it is so deep. It's so authentic. It's genuine. Like you can't get more genuine and authentic with with poetry because it's straight from the heart and feeling. Right. You know. So, how do you feel about, I guess, like minorities, like us? I'm Puerto Rican, and you know, come from New York. Like, and especially for men, it's tough to say, "Hey, I write poetry." Right. You know, it's kind of, back in my day, it wasn't cool. Say I'm a spoken word artist. Like, right. that's easier. That's, that's easier to say. It's That's more acceptable and it's more um, cool, so to speak. Right. To say right. I'm, a, I'm a spoken word artist instead of a poet. But um, what was your question? No, I'm saying, like, you know, as far as, like, you know, poetry coming back um, and really finding the venue. You know, um, I know around here there are some lounges that have spoken word night. Mm-hmm. You know, and just trying to get that vibe again, like you said, from back in the day of the, the 30s, 40s and 50s, where you had some out, true outlets to to kind of network with other you know, artists. Well, um, everybody is crazy because I've always had a different path than everybody. So I don't think I am the regular run of the mill spoken word artist. Um, so a lot of my poetry is Christian poetry. Okay. So most of the time, my venue is churches. Period. Awesome. Um, I, I, at first, I wasn't comfortable with doing poetry in like lounges and bars. Um, I've gotten more comfortable more recently, but uh, my venue by default has always been churches. Sim- possibly because I think my me poetry, me writing poetry is like writing sermons. Um, because I'm speaking. I'm saying what God wants me to say through poetry, like a preacher would say in a sermon. The only difference is I'm not talking at you. I'm speaking truth. And if you're convicted by it, that is your conviction that you need to deal with. So I just kind of talk, I just pretty much gather all the hard topics that people do not like to talk about. um, And I just talk about them. And then if you're convicted, then I think it's amazing that you're convicted because you should be. <laughs> and what's, what are some of those topics? Um, I delve anywhere from homosexuality to um, depression, hurt, anger, frustration, abandonment, um, anxiety, doubt, guilt, shame, loneliness, love, good and bad. Um, I don't know. Anything that that's at the root of you that's not considered of god but that we get ourselves into um but not necessarily in a judgmental way it's more of i'm just trying to give you what god says about it in a loving way not in a way where if you've ever lied or if you've ever taken a drink or if you've ever smoked you know anything it's more of this is what god says about it but you do you and, and if if Shanae's talking to you, Shanae is saying, "Do you?" But I'm gonna just give you God's perspective. When you decide to put a book together, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. What, what does it take for you to, to decide? That's a big that's a big step, and you got to have a lot of content to fill yeah. that book up, right? Yeah. So, so, what was that that day that said, "Wow, I'm gonna do this"? So I um I am a law school graduate. Um, I was awesome. going to be an attorney. 
and I didn't pass the bar. I took it three times and I didn't take pass the bar. On my, while I was in law school, I was actually academically dismissed from law school because I had some personal issues going on at home. So it was it was hard for me to keep up with school and try to handle personal business. So eventually I was academically dismissed. So on my break, I prayed and I was just like, God, what am I supposed to be doing on this break besides working? And God was like, you have plenty of time now to finally write your book. And so that's how the first book came about. The second book came about because I was in pain. Um, I had come from a broken relationship. And so while people fall into depression and pr probably promiscuity and um, I don't know, alcoholism or drug drug addictions and stuff like that, or even suicidal thoughts, I dove into my notebook and I dove into prayer and God because that's how I've always known how to get through things. So with in terms of content, um, I write poetry on a regular basis. So all I have to do is gather all the little pieces of paper that I have around the house or in the car or in my purse <laughs> They're everywhere, yeah. <laughs> in boxes, in po pants pockets. All I have to do is gather all of my poetry and kind of lay out which where I want my poetry to go based on if I wrote about women today, if I wrote about love today, if I wrote about hurt today, if I wrote about happiness today. Um, like, for instance, my third book is called Woman. And so most of my my poetry in my third book is pretty much all new poetry that I wrote specifically for women from for women of from all aspects of life, whether you are rich or poor, whether you are uh, married or single, whether you have kids or not, whether you are gay or not, whether you are a liar or not or a cheater or not, no matter what kind of woman you are, I wrote it for you and you take it and you run with it how you want to run with it. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, you said you know, you had anger issues mm -hmm. and, you, and you still do. You're still working through it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I do, but only I know it because I know how to compose it. So you right. don't see it. The only, and my, my husband to tell you this, he can, he'll always say, I know when Sinead don't feel like it because it's all over her face. I always say my face needs to be delivered. It's not my, it's not what I say. It's like my facial expressions are telling you exactly what I'm thinking. Right. <laughs> like right now. <laughs> <laughs> so where did the anger stem from? Like, did it stem from your childhood? What was your experience like? Like, um, I think it was because, so I was an only child and, and being an only child, I had a whole bunch of cousins. And I loved when my cousins would come over. And I found myself, as an adult looking back, I found myself always trying to fit in because I was spoiled. So my mom gave me everything. Um, and and my dad, like, you know, we had a great relationship when I was a child. But literally, I was I had everything that a kid could have ever wanted. So I had, for, for only one child who's going to ride one bike at a time, I had five bikes. I had a oh, wow. I had a but I had all kinds of bikes. I had mountain bikes, mongooses, um, other yeah. mongooses. I had a whole <laughs> bunch of bikes. I had bikes and skates and pool tables and a drum set and a dollhouse. I, I video games. I had everything that a girl and a boy could put together and play. And so whenever whenever I would be around my cousins, um, I found myself always trying to fit in and sometimes admitting now always stirring up trouble to try to fit into, into the mold of what they did. And then what I thought was right or wrong type thing. Um, that went to always feeling like from that going into friendships that, um, I always felt like if something had gone wrong, I was the one to blame. So it was always Sinead's fault. Everything was Sinead's fault. So it was almost like, well, dang, like, what did I do now? So it, that's, that's how it always was for me. And at least I, that's how I felt. And so from that, and then from some, I had like daddy issues at one point, And sometimes I still do. 
I had daddy issues. Um, my mom and I moved from house to house at one point. So, so all of that combined, um, whenever somebody would upset me, um, and I, I used to always tell people, I'm one of the sweetest people, but the sweethearts are the ones you need to watch out for. <laughs> so, Absolutely. The nicest people are the ones you need to watch out for because when we get upset, there is no coming back. It's over. Yeah. We, we don't know how to contain because we've all because we've given you chance after chance after chance after chance. And so from even that, like I had to I was a pure heart and still am partially a pure heart type person where I everybody was good. It's OK. It's nothing wrong. If it's my fault, I'm sorry. I'll take it in. And let's just be happy the very next day and let's be all fine and dandy. Um, but understanding over the years that not everybody's good, not everybody means you well. Um, and there are some things that may, for lack of a better word, piss you off. I would take my level of piss pissivity and I would grab and I would grab something and it and it was it could be something like small, like it could be like this lip gloss I have in my hand. It could be something small and I would just want to throw it. But in my head, I'm saying to myself, if I throw this, there is a possibility that it's going to break something and I don't want to get in trouble. So I would take that and I would just grab my pen and I would just start writing down how I felt. Did you ever find yourself being more loyal than your oh, friends and yeah. that getting that reciprocated? Yeah, yes, definitely. Um, I felt myself. I mean, as a kid, you all do you do dumb things in friendship yeah. relationship. As a young adult, you do dumb things in friendship and relationship. So I am never one to say that I was perfect in any relationship that I've been in. Um, but I did sometimes feel like when as a teenager, like if people would stop talking to me, I couldn't understand why. I was bullied when I was in the fifth grade. And then I would just kind of be really excited about getting friends and then all of a sudden it would be over and I don't, I'm not really sure of why. That even happens to me as an adult where people would get, get upset and I'm like, what the heck did I do now? And so my husband, my husband would go, Shanae, that's their problem, not yours. Right. So I've kind of learned over time how to let people go and just whatever issue they got to not internalize it because that's pretty much kind of where the anger came from, just internalizing other people's issues and making it seem like, well, did I do something wrong? And But they may have their own personal things that they're going through. And I think a lot of times, too, people don't know how to be friends anymore. Right. You know, I think that, that word friend has been diluted, right? Even yeah. the word best friend. It's crazy because one of my best friends, we're really tight. Like, we, we used to work together. And the, the guy that used to sit next to us, he said, um, he said, y'all are really close. I thought y'all were dating. I said, oh, what? Wow. <laughs> My, we we're both we were both engaged at the time and both getting married in the same year. And I was like, hmm. And so we both were like, please, elaborate. And so I said the, the issue with that is that's because you're not used to seeing friendship anymore. That's the problem. You're not used Correct. to seeing like genuine friendship. Like we're actually friends and we're very good friends. So it was just like to us, it made sense that if we came in at the same time, if we sit next to each other, oh, you're going to go eat? Yeah. What time are you going to go eat? Oh, let's go eat. Like it, it just yeah. made sense. So, yeah. So people do not understand friendship anymore, especially with the world of social media. And no, especially, especially if you're an honest person and yeah. you're giving that feedback and that person doesn't take it well and say, oh, what kind of friend are you? Well, I'm, I'm going to be your best friend by telling you the straight up truth. Right. And people can't handle the truth anymore. Right. My friends, we have um, one of my best friends. If I'm going to her about something, she'll say friendship circle. So when we say friendship circle, that means, OK, we about to have a hard, real, true conversation. Now, you may not like what I'm about to say, but I'm going to tell you. And that's just kind of how we roll. So for me, if you can't be that kind of person where we can have an honest conversation, you can tell me about myself. I can tell you about yourself and we may be in our feelings in the moment, but if we can get through it, then good. If we can't get through it, then evidently we weren't friends to begin with. So no, absolutely. It's 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 rough. I think it's even tougher for women though to be friends. Oh yeah, God. We are some bigger people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's so much competition, right? Because 
it's funny because me and my wife could be watching something. I see something totally different. She's like, oh, do you see her shoes? See how she's wearing this? I was like, no, I don't. I'm like, I'm never looking at that. <laughs> I'm like, so it's, it's, it's definitely different. And, and I see a lot of females who have a lot of male friends compared to having female friends. Yeah. You know, and I know you, you said, you know, you, you do a lot of your, your poetry in the church. When did you feel comfortable with your spoken word? It was like, I'm, I'm a badass writer. Like, I, I'm dope. Did you ever doubt your skill? Did I ever doubt my skill? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, no, I can't say I doubted my skill, no. Um, I would say that I became complacent in mm-hmm. my skill, where I wasn't stretching. Like, um, there was a t- So it, it's cool when you can put together metaphors and similes and make it sound good and make and make reference to a tree when you're talking about life or you can make reference to a bookshelf when you're talking about words or something like that versus when you go through real life and and life is literally saying no come out of creativity and let's be honest come out of being just honest and let's be transparent let's like I said let's have a real conversation and that is where poetry for me kind of took a turn like um and my early poetry, when I go back and I read some of the things that I wrote in middle school, in high school, and in early college, um, I came out of being creative and rhyming, like a rhyming scheme, to after into law school and into adulthood and really talking to the people and not the, the creativity or try to manipulate the creativity or a person's mind with creativity. Right. So, uh, so to me, that was very important to, for, for me to speak to your heart and not try to manipulate you with rhyming. Right. I hear that. Because at that point, you, you, that's more of a kind of a strong, a strong structure. Right. But it's been more of a hip hop style type of, of rhyming right. compared to the spoken word, which is, is different. Right. It's very different. So right. did you have support? Like, or did you keep it to yourself that you were writing this? Like, did you, were you openly about it? Were you sharing that with people at first? Um, I didn't know how to. I didn't not have support. I just didn't know. Like, I had to find me first before I was writing honest type poetry. So for me, like, when, like, whoever, whoever's a spoken word artist, you have to go through the process of life and what's going on with you because it's easier to talk about you and then hopefully it re- it permeates from you into somebody else's life and so then that way you can relate to them through poetry versus um you trying to muster up something that may sound good so like i i ask people now to stretch me where i'll say give me a word what are you dealing with and I mm-hmm. ask them to tell me what they're dealing with so that I can put it in a poem and then I can put myself in their shoes, even though I'm not them. So gotcha. I can be able to speak to their heart. Like my, my, um, the beginning of my book say, um, I write from my heart to reach the hearts of others. I like that. Because I want to know if I'm going to write a poem for you, if I'm going to speak for you, I want to know what it is that you're dealing with so I can talk to your heart. I don't want to talk to your mind because your mind can be manipulated. Your heart can't be. Right. So I want to talk to the the heart because the heart of you is, is, is where the root of you is and your spirit and your soul. So that's why I love doing Christian poetry. I actually expanded. um, My inspiration was Jackie Hill Perry. Mm -hmm. Um, I love her. (laughs) Yeah. Don't know me. I, but I know her and that's we best friends for real. <laughs> but she was my inspiration along with genetics and Preston Perry and um, Ezekiel, as well as Chris, um, Chris Webb, too. I think that's his name. I think that's his name. I got to look it up. But um, he was an inspiration to me as well, where I would hear some of their poetry through. Um, oh, what is that organization called? Um it's it's out of California. I can't remember the organization right now, but um, from just hearing poetry that's so authentic and that's their story, and it's they don't have to make it up. That it's just literally their story, 
it made me want to tell mine. And it made me want, it, it would encourage me really to stop feeling like who, who cares about whether someone judges me? It, somebody needs to be free. So I'm going to speak from my heart to reach yours. Yeah, that's that's a lot you just said. Yeah. That's a lot to digest. It really is. No, like yeah. you got me thinking now. Like because of the fact that you know when I started writing, it was because I got my heart broken at 13, mm-hmm. right? And I uh, I went to the mall, cut school, played some hooky, went to the mall, went to the cafeteria that was in the the, the food court, and I just started writing, and then. After that, I got I got I got, got infectious. I kept on writing and writing and writing. Yeah. Do you feel Do you feel now that you're at a time to where because you have all this now social media, right? Mm-hmm. Everything's so available. Mm-hmm. Do you, you have your stuff like on audio? Do you ever think about putting like an audio I book out? I don't. Everybody, ev- you're like I don't. Ca- I can't tell you the no- your the, your number of how many people asked me within like the last two weeks. I haven't just yet. Um, to do that, you have to be able to afford it. So I haven't, I haven't gotten to the point where I can put it on audio just yet. But um, I think I'm a little old school where I like for you, I like to perform for you. Absolutely. And minister to you so that you will want to say to me, hey, you have like a CD that I can put in my car Mm -hmm. or do you have like a, because, and I, I love, I love these because to me, a CD, a CD is good for, of course, for putting it in your ears or Mm -hmm. if you want to put it on your iPod or your phone, that's great. But you can be in a situation where you may not be, be able to have access to, the audio portion of it, but you can look at the words. Absolutely. Or you, or you may be in a situation where if you remember the words, you can start saying it to yourself instead of having to rely on putting something in your ear. So I think for me, like now I practice more of, um, cause I deal with personally, I deal with anxiety and like seasonal depression. So I've learned over time how to, come away from putting stuff in my ear all the time to sustain my mental well-being to talking to myself and meditating on what God tells me, what God promises me and me speaking into myself so that I'm not always relying on headphones. Like I don't want to be so relying on headphones that I forget the things that I already know. That makes sense. That's why I love books. Oh yeah. So do I. Like I, I have a large collection. I'm always reading. And, but it's also a different medium because yeah, people definitely. do consume stuff differently, definitely. and it, and it just it just it just gives you that that extra piece of content that people can digest. So, yeah. you you said something. You said you know you, you suffer some some seasonal de- depression and some anxiety. How do you handle that? Um, honestly, my husband helps me a lot. Really? Um, yeah, he does <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, but. Even before him, um, what I would do is, like, I just, like, I would just remind myself of who I am. So, like, the seasonal depression or the anxiety come from my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, And, like, you know, when it's cold outside, you can't do nothing but be in the house. Absolutely. You have to, like, for me, like, right now, my bedroom is light. Um, But my, where we live, my living room is very dark. So depending on how I'm feeling, I can sit in the dark because I'm chilling. But if I'm not feeling any kind of way, um, if I'm not feeling up to it, what I'll do is what my mom taught me, um, I'll come in my room and I'll open my blinds and let the light hit me. Um, or I'll or I'll watch something really funny. Or like I just make up in my mind really early on, or I have made up in my mind early on that. Every, I think at some point in your life, almost everyone will probably deal with or have dealt with seasonal depression, yeah. where you've been depressed at some point of your sure. life. Um, but you have to decide in that depression that it's not going to linger and it's not going to define how your life is going to go overall. 
So that is what I've done. I've just said to myself, I'm happy today. I'm just going to remain happy. And I may feel like this, but I'll keep talking to myself. Or like, I'll, or I'll grab this little remote control right here. <laughs> and play the Xbox. <laughs> there, there you go. There and you I'll go. Hey, 19. <laughs> but do you feel like great artists kind of walk that type of that type rope of depression and anxiety like um sadly i can't say all and i can't even say majority because i don't know but sadly some um robin williams is a perfect example yeah yeah that's right artist and but being clinically depressed yeah. and not having no idea that he's going through this stuff um and stuff like that wakes me up to where if I'm smiling a lot, um, I need to make sure I'm smiling genuinely. So, like, I'll look, I actually now look myself in the mirror and look myself in the eye and make sure that what I see is happiness and joy. And I'm not putting on the mask. I'm very intentional about that every day. Um, so, yeah, like, I think, like, I, I was actually at a, a book fair last year. And this lady said the, the year before that, she was actually on the brink of committing suicide oh, and, wow. and, and, but not under, not really realizing that the public doesn't understand the creative mind is dangerous because we go through a lot mentally to be creative. So, so she actually took the time to speak into us as creatives because of how we have to always kind of shift our minds into thinking creatively so that we can speak to the audience, but then nothing may not be left for us. And so I am very, very proactive in leaving something for myself. I'm taking something first, I'll give you what I have in the middle, and then I'm taking the last part of it. Because I matter to me more than, honestly, more than my audience. I'm, I have to matter to myself first. Absolutely, you're right, because I always thought that, you know, you know people kind of get used to actors crying and stuff like that. And it's like, for an actor to cry in a spot, there's got to be something in your head that's that's a little, you know, wrong <laughs> to get you in that spot. Yeah, I heard like, Mary Lori say, um, I, heard, I heard her say one day, if I'm correctly, that she, if she had to cry, like, she would just think there's something to make her sad. And you don't realize that you can get in the habit you can be really, really happy, but then get into the habit of sabotaging your happiness yeah. by thinking of uh, thinking of things that make you sad, or thinking of things that are that that you know is not really you. Like I had to, I actually like I've been to therapy. Um, I have I have talked things out with hus with husband, with aunt, with mom, with as many people as I needed to talk to because my mental health to me and just me in general just started to be a little bit more important than people. So I just, I kind of just learned how to like be in the house by myself and just be chilling while my husband's at work. And right. if I feel like writing, I feel like writing. If I don't, I'd rather do something else. Like I've kind of just learned how to not live for people, but allow God to speak into me so that I can speak into people, but I'm not necessarily living for a person's reaction. Like right now, I had, like we're talking, but I have my phone on my left and my iPad on my right with Facebook and Instagram. On Facebook, I have three people watching me. On Instagram, I have one person watching me and you're watching me. That's a total of five. I'm not so bogged down in just five people watching me when I know that at a certain point, one of the most yeah. probably depressed peasant-like people will hear my poetry and that'll save that person's life. I'm not, at first I was all about the numbers, but I started to get more in about the heart and about who I'm touching versus how many people are watching me on a daily basis. I think you said something too about therapy and, you know, in the black Hispanic community, it's kind of taboo. Oh yeah. We, to us, it's Jesus and poetry and you should be good. Yeah. So, Prayer. Yeah, because it's just like, it's almost like you're soft, you can't handle something. I'm not sure where it stemmed from, uh, just the, the lack of trust. I think people also think therapy is advice and it's not, right? Therapy is about you finding the answers within yourself and that person's helping you through that. 
and people tend to think, oh, but I'm going to sit there for some couch, right? Like, you know, like this, the famous couch and have someone tell me what to do, but they're not telling you what to do at all. Mm-hmm. So what made you kind of cross that and say, I'm going to oh, therapeutic? I'm... Oh, see, that's the thing. I'm Like I said, I'm not the typical, uh, uh, <laughs> I hate to say this, but I am the typical black person where it's Jesus in prayer and you should be good. No, ther- therapists will put here for a reason. So evidently they have some type of mental skill that I don't. So if I needed to get up, get through that breakup and get through some of the things that I was dealing with within myself and having some identity issues, I ran to therapy. Ain't nobody had to tell me to go. I made the decision myself to go because I needed to figure out what was it about me? Why am I so loyal to my detriment? Why am Mm. I so um, hungry for love? when I should be finding it within myself, whether that was friendship, whether that was intimacy or even family, why can't Shanae find love within herself? And I wanted to answer that question. And so, and was I scared of that answer? Yeah, but I was more, I was more scared of never knowing the answer. So that's why I ran to therapy. Like I don't, I'm not about hiding. Like I remember TD Jake said, there's, you can't, you can't, conquer the things you won't confront right and so i i confront a lot in myself and people i still do it now where i'm confronting all the time and my husband like i always ask him because he's my my sponge and i always ask him what makes you attracted to me after i tell you all this stuff and he said it's because you tell me all this stuff it's because you're so honest and it's because you're saying you're not saying it in terms of offense you're saying it because you're asking the the return question is, can you help me with the things that I'm telling you? So you're sharing, yeah, you're definitely sharing it. Sharing. I think a lot of couples don't do that though. They tend to keep it to themselves and don't know how actually how to be a married couple, right? It's it's reciprocal. Like same way you're sharing with him, he has to share with you. Yeah. And and to be honest, like you know, if if one or two people need therapy, the support has to be there. The support right. has I to be there. I had therapy, though, um, before I got married. Um, but I helped. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I didn't want I didn't want to take a whole bunch of baggage that I didn't have to take into a marriage when he had, like, he had nothing to do with it. And so I, I told him when we first met, I said, I'm going to tell you now, I got a lot of stuff with me. So I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to feel like I'm doing anything wrong, so you might want to keep going. And he was like, nah. And so he he and he constantly always says, no, like you're you're my wife. I'm gonna be here for you. I love you. And he kinda he still has to talk me into that. Cause you know, as women, we can feel like we're being burdened or we're being too emotional or we're, you know, being too much. So he he's strong enough where he can help me with you're not being a burden. You're just being yourself. And it's okay to be yourself. No, that's that's great you have that. Because I think nowadays, even for men, we're being told it's okay to be emotional now. Yeah. You know, growing up, it was like, now you can't do that. Yeah. You know, now you scrape your knee, man up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And now to have that and to have support, it's it's amazing. I mean, you can share that and, and be yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, and then for, like, for yourself to have that vessel of poetry... That's even like up here, because you get to have another another uh, outlet to just let it go, mm-hmm. you know. So, how much do the, I know? I know you say you write anywhere you can. Do you have a structure to your writing? Do you say I'm going to write every day? It just does it come to like everyone has a different process. Um, I don't write every day anymore. Sometimes I would write. I remember I used to write like ten poems a week. Um, wow. Yeah, some I would just be on a roll where I would just keep writing. Um, but now, you know, when you get older and you got responsibilities, you don't really have time to sit as much. So sometimes I may go, I may go a couple months without writing a poem. Um, but I've written so much that I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but but then there'll come a time where I realize, oh goodness, I ain't wrote a poem in like three weeks. Let me sit down and try to muster up something. Um, but then there are other times when I'll hear a rhyme in my head and I'll go, I'll write that down before I forget. 
And then all of a sudden a poem would just kind of spark out of it. So um, like a prime example was uh, I heard um, I was in bed one night and I was trying to go to sleep because I had a, had a long day. It was probably almost two in the morning. And um, I heard God say, you can't go to sleep until you write this poem. And I said, OK. So like, evidently, I'm going to be awake till I grab my pen. So <laughs> I grabbed my pen and grabbed a piece of paper and everything that he was saying to me just started to download. And, you know, with spiritual stuff, some people have the gift where you can hear God's voice. And then other people go, how did you do that? How do you know what he's saying? Well, me personally, I can hear God's voice. So I could literally hear everything he was telling me to write. And I just wrote it down and just kind of structured it so that it could, you know, make sense. Right. And when, like he said to me one day, um, God said, you can't be used like Esther with a Gomer mentality. Mm. And when I realized that what he was saying, I was like, oh, my, I got to write that down. That just blew your mind. Yeah. <laughs> blew my mind. I had to write it down. And I couldn't believe that we can be like our hearts can be in, in an Esther territory, but our minds can be like Gomer. We can be whorish of the mind, but really, you know, faithful in our hearts. And how are we to serve two things? Like, like I, I was just blown. And I had to write that down. So I wrote it down and my poem used that everybody loves came out of it. And it convicted me. It sometimes still convicts me when I recite it. So yeah, it's just, it. that's just how sometimes my process goes or like I'll grab my phone and I'll hear, um, I'll hear just something random that will pop into my head and I'm like, oh, that gotta be God. So I'll write it down. Yeah. Uh, so that's sometimes how it'll happen where I'll hear like a line or two and I'll just kind of write around that line or two. Where do you want your poetry to go? Where do you want to go with your poetry? I would love one day for my poetry to be in school. Yeah. Um, when I was in high school, uh, they used to say that my poetry, um, they used to say when we get old, uh, the kids who are in school are going to be reading your poetry and analyzing it like we used to do with Shakespeare. And I would love for that one day. I would love for my books to be in like museums. It's it's funny because this po this book, um, Vent the Different Faces of Me, my first one, um, this actual copy is the very first copy I have ever ordered. So it's all beat up and ripped up and everything, but- that That's good, that means it's been read. <laughs> yeah, so this is very, like this is actually my proof where I have wrote in it and edited and, so, but nobody has this but me. So I would love to be able to like pass something like this down on my children when I have children one day and their children and their children. And um, and I would just love, I, my goal is to be an international motivational speaker slash book and word artist to speak at conferences and different things where I just feel like I feel like we're all trying to get to the same heaven. We're all trying to get to the same finish line. So why can't we get there together? Why can't we figure out how to motivate each other to get there together? I'm not trying to get there before you trust me. But why can't, while, while, while we're all in this race, why can't we be in the race together, hand in hand, working hard, trying to figure out how do we get to God all at the same time even if we have to go through different paths, even if it's different times, how do we do it hand in hand? How do we, yeah. No, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think the fact is that people still tend to look at each other's competition. Yeah. So it says just focusing on the finish line, yeah. right? Like you should just be worried about your best time instead of the person next to you. Yeah. And whatever your best time is, that's as meant for you to be then at that time. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you, you want to be the speaker what are you doing now to to, to jumpstart that, to get that going? So I'm a firm, like, Jay-Z, I'm a hustler. I'm mm -hmm. a hustler, homie. Ask you me, and my brother-in-law watching, you just saw me <laughs> quote Jay-Z. Give me my props, because he always Thank tells you. me how Christian I am, <laughs> brother-in-law. Um, but um, I honestly, I just kind of meet people on the fly, and I'll say, like, we'll be in conversation. I'll say, oh, you have a, an event. I'm a spoken word artist. If you need some spoken word, just let me know. Or um, 
miraculously, I am, I guess I'm good enough where people see my video and they'll contact me via Facebook or Instagram and they'll go, yo, we, I'm having an event and I need this particular poem that you said at that event that I saw in this video. So it'll, I've lately, here lately, it's been that, um, or somebody would, uh, would say, hey, a friend of mine is a really good spoken word artist, so let me give you her contact, that's happened. Um, I started my, officially started my business, Church Girl Incorporated, in November of last year, and as soon as I announced it via social media, because you know once you hit social media, it's official. It's official, no so, doubt. I said it on Facebook that I was starting my own business and I was stepping out on faith and people have been booking me left and right. So, so talk more about that business. Yeah. And it's really networking and really just building relationships with people. So what, what exactly are you trying to do with that business though? What's the main goal with that? The main goal is really, it's the motivational speaking. It's spoken word. It will, I want it to be scholarships one day. I want to have women's conferences and teen conferences and, men conferences and um i don't know just professional conferences and uh financial development just anything dealing with the everyday person um and just build an empire off of that that is my goal and really one of my number two of my number one goals is to be able to start young kids out with part-time jobs where they are working for somebody who looks like them or yeah. They're working for a minority, even if even if you're Caucasian, you're working for a minority and being able to understand that if you can respect me as a black woman, then you'll be able to respect anybody because Absolutely. we are a, we are considered at the bottom. So if you can respect me as a black woman with natural hair, mm -hmm. then you can respect anybody um, with working professionals, because I had a hard time trying to find a job after having a law degree. I want to be able to be the avenue where if you need to pay your bills, come work for me for a couple months until you can get on your feet. You don't, it don't have to be long time um, for a long term. Just let me be able to help you. And that's where I, I want to be able to help fund, you know, people's other people's dreams. So yeah. kind of kind of what I want to do. I love I love talking and speaking to people, especially through spoken word and be able to hear their hunger that they have of healing and the hunger of they, they have of being delivered and set free. I really want to be able to give back to people the way God has been given to me. And I feel like if I don't, that's slapping the face for him. And I'm, I, I ain't for slapping Jesus. Look out. <laughs> so, so when you were in law school and you didn't pass the bar and you said you couldn't get a job, was it because you were overqualified? Yeah. And people just want to say, no, I, I, I can't hire you because of this. They see law degree and all of, oh, God, she has a law degree. She's smart. She's never, she, she's too smart to work here, evidently. Cause <laughs> I met some dumbass lawyers. I don't know. I mean, yeah. Some <laughs> There's some dumbass doctors, too, like, you know, yeah, some, some quacks. Some <laughs> but either I was too smart because I had a law degree and I was applying to jobs that was below my pay grade, or I didn't have the experience with a law degree that they wanted. So I was a double whammy. So I got to a point where I was just saying, okay, you know what? My my voice is going to is going to to help me get through paying my, my bills. My voice and my gift is going to help me finance my life. My voice and my bills is going to be able to help me support my family. Um, and I'm very good at what I do. So because I'm very good, I was like, well, shoot, I might as well expand on what I'm good at. <laughs> it's just love a word. Did you always have this this confidence about yourself? Oh, not at all. Not at all. Again, husband. <laughs> not at all. I am a firm believer in um the confidence, like I said, came before he before he came, I started to get confident by myself, but he just enhanced it. Right. So like he tells me nine I don't know how many times a day how beautiful and sexy I am. So now I think I'm beautiful and sexy because my husband tells me all the time. <laughs> or he tells me how gifted I am or how creative I am or how great I am. Like he always speaks into me. And it's, I think it's very important to be able to speak into your spouse because you could be saving your spouse's life. You could be um, saving just the little part of them that they have left to be able to grow it into something that they never thought they would have. So, and I do the same for him where now, like 
he's in um, school getting his web design degree um, to be able to expand his business and be able to give back to the community and provide IT classes for kids in the inner city who can't afford IT classes. So he, so in that way, we, we balance each other, where we also test each other, where um, if I am falling one day, he's picking up my slack. If he's falling one day, I'm picking up his, and that's just kind of, kind of what we do. No, you're absolutely right. I think, you know, giving someone awareness of how good they are is huge, especially if you're a parent as well, if you have children, you know, by you saying that to a young child, and a lot of kids don't get to hear that about that, right? So if you said that to a young child, hey, you're great at what you're doing now, that can really spark something for a lifetime. Mm-hmm. You know, and a lot of a lot of inner city kids don't get to hear that. I know I didn't hear that when I was a kid in, in, in Brooklyn, the projects. Like, you just didn't hear that. There, there wasn't that common theme anywhere in the, in the hood. Yeah, like my dad used to tell, tell me all the time, practice makes perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my mom, my mom is a nut in the best way possible. Like, I tell people all the time, my mom is crazy, but she's the craziest funniest person you'll ever meet but she always she said something to me when I was in law school and that has that and she keep calling me and I keep pushing in if I, <laughs> I'm doing but and she's gonna see this live video and say oh so you was ignoring me because you was on social media. Absolutely. but she she said something to me while I was in law school that I'll never forget um she said Shanae she said uh we don't fail we fix it Mm. And I said, oh, she said that was good, wasn't it? I said, girl, <laughs> was good. so and it, it really spoke to me like I was like, man, like that was that was good. And it, it really it, it made me understand that I'm not I may feel like I have failed at it, but you haven't failed at it until you stop. Just fix it. Figure out a way to get it done. Right. And I was like, man, like that was good. No, you're right. And I like I, I, the part that you said, you know, like having young kids with minority owners. Yeah. Because that's huge. You know, living in Atlanta, in Atlanta I love it because it's, it's really like, it's real life Wakanda here. Yeah. I, I, I love it. I'm, 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 listen, I'm a citizen of Wakanda. I don't know where <laughs> No, because <laughs> no, you get to see black entrepreneurship here. You mm-hmm. don't get to see like that, you know. Don't know that it's, it's everywhere in the U.S., but it's really heavy here, and it's mm-hmm. old school owners here. You know right. what I'm saying? And you have that, and it's amazing to see, right. and that needs to be praised more and and seen more. Like to your, to your point, partnering with these these small businesses, or small business owners, saying, "Hey, do you mind doing an internship or externship? Mm-hmm. You know, um, I have a couple people here. What's the values they bring to you? Hey." It's going to bring loads of value to you. It's mm-hmm. going to be engagement. These people are going to talk more about your business for, as well. And you actually just you know what? Giving back to the community. Yeah. Which is huge, which I don't think we do enough of. You know what I'm saying? Because we tend to, a lot of times I see that like, you're very giving of your poetry, which is fantastic. A lot of people would just hoard that and hold it in and not let the, the masses see it mm-hmm. or, or hear it. And at that point, it's like, well, I need to know that someone like me that looks like me that does the same thing as me. And, and that's why I really want to be that that kind of business owner. Because like it's just like a Michelle Obama where she looks like me and she was in the White House. Yeah. She looks like me. Her hair was natural. She was her authentic self. And she was just classy. And people talked about her and they made fun of her. And she was still so classy. And I'm like, man, I need to learn how to do that. Because when people... Say something about me, I'm gonna snap back. So I need to learn how not to snap back. <laughs> and, not, and not throw lip gloss at people, yeah. I ain't, so, always, I ain't always there yet. So. No, but you're right, because you know what? That's where white people had a disconnect. They didn't understand how we gravitated to them so much, the Obamas, when they went into office, because they, yo, we finally seen somebody that looks like that looks like me. But my uncle looks like Barack Obama. You know? So it was like, yo, like, like to see that. And mm-hmm. I get to live to see that mm-hmm. as an amazing thing. And it's and for little kids to grow up with that now, right? Because we had, what, 43 other presidents that were, like, just white. And they said, hey, you can, you can be, become president. But was that really a dream of everybody to become president? I had slaves. My, yeah. My, my president ain't had slaves. No. You know what I'm saying? So, and that's, and that's the biggest thing to your point, you know, to have that face to say, hey, I am doing this. Even to your husband doing 
uh, web design because a lot of times in, in the black community gets no no props for technology. Right. It's so it. tough. And he loves it, and he's so he's so um, knowledgeable about it. He's like he ain't anything gadgety. He buys anything. Like <laughs> he loves he like all of our TVs in the house are mounted. He buys sound boards. I don't know how that <laughs> works. I, like I'll be like Terrence, how does this? What is this? How does this work? What is it? So I mean, it's just amazing that like. Even like if, if the Xbox ain't working, I got a problem because I won't play this game. So come <laughs> fix it. He could be playing the Xbox in the living room. And I'm like, uh-uh, come fix mine first before you play yours. Come fix mine. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's I think it's really important. And I, and I think I think if we just if we're just given a chance to show that we've come as black people, as Hispanic people, we have come so far in in having the knowledge just about certain things that that Caucasians don't understand that we have knowledge about. Like no. we're actually very smart. Yeah. All of us aren't living below the poverty line. No. All of us are not and are not always still in the hood. And even if we are, we probably choose to stay there because that's home. Don't mean that we poor. Exactly. That's home. Exactly. So I, I just think that's just like I just feel like if you if you don't want us to treat you any kind of way because you're not down and because you always got something up your butt, then don't feel like we're stupid. Right. Not, we're not all stupid. No. And I got to say, in my career, there was, there was plenty of times that I, I, had, I just had my GED and I'm self-taught. Mm-hmm. And I dropped out of school ninth grade. Mm-hmm. You know, so it came down to a point where I got into far in my career making six figures, but at the same time, I had to be 10 times better than the average white person. Mm-hmm. You know, I had to show them, hey, I'm just as smart as this person, even though they have a university degree. And they were always surprised, like, oh, wow, you're doing so good for who you are. Like, no, I'm doing good because I'm doing good. Don't put that premise on top of it. Oh, you know, the people are surprised. Oh, you're Hispanic or you're black. I didn't think that you'd be that good. You get to, You tend to get that a lot. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I think the times are changing, especially with the new generation coming in, where these millennials are really kind of changing the game. And a lot of people feel uncomfortable with that. Yeah. Because honestly, this country is going to be brown very soon. It's brown already. And a lot of white people are getting really scared about that. Right. And it's like, no, don't get scared about it. But understand that, you know what? America is going to look like one true nation finally. Right. And if, in a few decades, I and mean, you're going to be able to tell what America looks like. And that's why we're so I think that's why we're so at odds with each other, because millennials not having it. Millennials mm-hmm. that when you see T-shirts that say, um, um, <laughs> I'm not my ancestors, right. sign these hands, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm them. Yeah. I'm, like, I'm not here for it. You can't yeah. do that to me. Or um, like I tell people all the time. I'm really nice until you upset me. And then however you decide to treat other people, that's fine. But disrespect, don't live here. So you can't, there are certain things you can't say to me because I just don't, I don't like it. And that's just how millennials are. Like, we're we're not here for it. Like, we don't like it. And deal with the fact that we don't like it. Now, granted, I do, I do think that millennials can be a little more respectful when it yeah. comes to elders i do believe that yeah um we could we could be a little more respectful um and and res- and be sensitive to the fact that an elder is going to do what they do and how they do it because that's how they were taught Correct. but elders also have to be sensitive to the fact that millennials are going to act the way they act because of what they saw right and because of what they were taught so I think I think for me it's on that top, on that subject it's a double edged sword. Like you gotta, you, it, for me it's, it all goes down to just respecting each other's opinion and just and and really coming to a consensus consensus of this is how we are now. We have our differences, but why can't like I said earlier, why can't we walk hand in hand? Because it, it's it's proven that we we do better in, in separate groups. If you want to be this group or this group. Since you have the same ideals I have, I'm going to chill with you. But you don't learn from that. 
Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You can't learn from a bunch of people who have the same ideals as you. You know, you yeah. tend to learn more when you, you infuse yourself with different folks that has different values and different ideals. Yeah. Again, like you said, you don't have to agree with them, but you're definitely going to learn from and appreciate their, their their viewpoint and their lens. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, what I feel like right now, too, is that minorities, we do good at coming together when an issue pops up. Right. But we don't do good about keeping the issue alive. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. if, if, you know, it's, thing, it's the next thing that's hot. It's the next thing right. that, that has, like, that's just like this whole R. Kelly thing. And it, it went from R. Kelly to Jesse, Jesse Smollett, Smollett to, to Michael Jackson. Back to Michael Jackson, back to R. Kelly, R. Kelly. and then to Michael Jackson tomorrow. And then Jess, Jesse's going to come up again. Correct. So I just feel like we don't focus on one thing at a time because it's whatever's hot, it's whatever's good. That's what's making money. Yeah. And Quite frankly, I'm tired. <laughs> yeah. All this stuff makes me tired. Like, <laughs> I'm still trying to get over this whole R. Kelly thing. No, yeah, so am I. Like, it's just one at a time. Me and my wife have a, have another podcast together called Couples Corner. And um, we're going to talk about that. You know, and it's going to be like, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's just like, you know what? It's not about bashing no one, right? Mm-hmm. But at the same time, at the end of the day, all cultures have issues. Right. All, all cultures may have pedophiles. And it's not just to blast. It just so happens to be the three people they're bringing up just so happen to be black. That's because the, the people <laughs> they're bringing up, the black people that they're bringing up, it's because you are already exploiting black people. If right. you're already exploiting black people, then we're going to keep exploiting black people as if you can't look online and look up the sex offender registry and see how many different kinds of people are on right. it. Right, Exactly. Exactly, and of all ages as well. There's yeah. like, you, you, there's a lot of young people who are on that list, right. you know. And honestly, like, you know, if you were to put a list up and try to, you know, you have a family, you know, I have, and it's tough too because I have, my daughter is Afro Latina, right? So my wife is Afro Latina, so she has a f- couple of things going against her. One, she's a, she's a girl, she is black, and then she's also Latina at the same time. Right. And and I gotta show her how to how to appreciate all three, accept all three, and then have an understanding that guess what? In both cultures, you may not be fully accepted. You may not be black enough. You may, you may not be Latina enough. And that happens. I think, tell her, I think Afro-Latinas are beautiful. Personally. No, yeah. She's, and I tell her every day she's beautiful. I, I give her, every day I give her compliments about herself to make sure she's strong and she's fulfilled. And say, you know what? Dude, don't worry about what else no one else says. You know, right. my wife did the same thing as well. I said, no, because she looks exactly like my wife. And I was like, hey, you are beautiful. Right. You know, look look, at, look in the mirror. What did you see right here? You know, if I'm telling you you're beautiful, don't, don't worry about it. Nobody else says. Right. Make and sure you feel it. You know, and, she, and she's great because she loves to draw. She can, she's like really an engineer. She can build stuff out of cardboard boxes that you won't believe. Mm-hmm. And um, she'd rather have a cardboard box than anything else. And she'll build a whole entire house. And I, I continue to in, encourage her to continue doing that. You know, she writes little books and she'll paste them together with illustrations and everything. And I was like, we're going to publish your book soon. And so then by 13, we said we're going to publish a book by the time she turns 13. And she's 11 now. So it's like doing that and uplifting our our youth to say, yo, you got this. I'm going to show you what I didn't have. Now that I'm old enough and I know what it is, is, let's get you put on. And I, and I I don't think we do that enough. We don't put each other on enough. Yeah. You know, yeah, definitely. It's, it's it's crazy how we tend to hold a lot of stuff close to the vest and don't get back to the community as well. Right. My one of my um one of my other best friends, she's a um she's a plus size model, and she was like, I'm telling you, she an event I got. I'm like, look, you need to spoke with more artists. I'm like, look, an event I got. Look, you need a model. Here she is, right here. Like, yeah. what you need? Like, I'm having. So I'm having my third book signing on June 1st in Raleigh um, at a church called um, Millennium Revival Center. Okay. And, and I did a fundraiser so that I can be able to afford the space. And so because I did a fundraiser, the Lord was like, I want you to create a space where you can get 25 other small businesses the opportunity to come and network with each other so that you all can build together. And Absolutely. so they can build a, a family of business. Of, of business people who are, okay, 
I know this spoken word artist. I know this candle maker. I know this paparazzi jeweler. I know this real estate agent. I know this Mary Kay person. I know exactly. this food person and desserts and whatever. Um, and so I just gave I just gave away 25 free vendor tables and just like, come on, like just tell me you want to sign up. Come sign up. Come get your vendor table. My goal is to have 150 to 200 people come in the door. We're going to have some poetry. We're going to have some worship. We're going to have y'all be patronized and we're going to get to heaven together. See that's 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 content for you right there, that's your YouTube channel. I'm telling you right Absolutely. now, that's you know, and, and it's amazing because what you're speaking about is, is simple networking, and right. as minorities, we are horrible about that. We're good about going to the barbecue and get a plate, oh. but when it <laughs> when it comes, <laughs> yeah, that's the only time we're gonna make sure we're there for something. But then when it comes out to networking and support, we still struggle with that, man. Yeah. And it's always a fucking fight for that. And it's like you know we got we got to get that better because like you said. It's, it's like back in the day with farmers. If if I just raised cattle and you did vegetables, we're gonna trade, we're gonna barter. Right. And networking is the same exact thing. So if you are a, 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 someone who owns a cleaners and you are someone who has a restaurant, let's barter. I, I would I would clean your clothes and give me a discount for some food. Like right. does it let's make something happen. But that's you a pride saying? thing. That's a pride it thing. Is. Where it's more of it's not, it, and that's the microwave society we live in. Mm -hmm. It's more of. I don't want to go through the process of getting the money. I want to have the money. Right. But you don't want to go through the process to get it. You already want to have it because you think you're entitled to have it. And quite frankly, like, um, like my co you talked to my cousin Sheena. Yep. Um, La La Four is a fit. La Four is a fit. Yep. She's amazing. <laughs> you talk to <laughs> Sheena. Sheena has she encourages me. She has been posting videos and workouts and everything for years. And she'll get five views and 10 views. And I'm like, dang, she's still, po that is encouraging. She's still posting. Yeah. And then I look up one day and she got almost 5,000 followers. I'm like, dang, <laughs> that is consistency right there. Yes, it is. But, I, but I've also seen, I've also seen the struggle outside of social media I've, because we're family. So I've seen, I've seen the circumstances that she's, that she's been in. And being a single mom and trying to raise her children and trying to work out and keep her mental health together. So it's not a lot of us who have that work ethic where we can go through the process. We just want the money already. Because you know what? Because we try to chase the bag. Yeah. You know, in hip hop culture, the first thing you see is the end result, right? You see, you see the cars, you see the big houses, you see the jewelry and the fancy clothes. But they never talk about the studio time they spent, mm -hmm. hours, weeks, and months to 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 make the album right mm -hmm. that's not spoken about that mm -hmm. and that and to your point we have to fall in love with the process that right. the, the, that journey is the best piece and once you hit the summit the goal what is there to do you got to look for your next challenge right. you know what i'm saying so you you have to go after that process completely and when you come down to writing like for myself once i finish it's great but it's done Mm -hmm. it, it, it was that mid that middle point when I'm actually doing the process of writing, getting my emotions poured out. And I'm like, wow, this is insane. I don't know if I can go this deep. And that's why you and that's why you constantly write books because once once my first book was published in 2013, I'm like, okay, at this point, it's almost at the time it was two years later, and I'm like, okay, so now this is this pain right here is more content for me to write book number two. So right. then book number two. When everybody sees this cover, they like they automatically gravitate to the cover. Put that closer to the to the to the to the, to the camera. They're already they're already gravitating to the cover, right. and then um and gravitating to the cover, they're like, dang yo, I need I need that I need, like that right there I need that. Yeah. And so at that point, I'm like, okay, if people are saying they need this, I need to write a third one so that you can need this one exactly. because. Because my writing is only going to expand after after my pain. I don't want to just write from a, just a painful place. I want to talk to the happy people, too. Sure. I want to talk to the people who, okay, we're not in pain no more. Now we live in our best life. So now how do we keep living our best life? You know what I'm saying? Like, how do we how do we get to, to vacation in Aruba and not have to worry about paying a bill tomorrow? <laughs> right. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, because people use their rent money to go to Aruba. Absolutely. For real. <laughs> Yes, I'm like, I tell all the time. If you had to use your rent money, you couldn't afford to go. Exactly. That's why I ain't been yet. But we, no, we're, <laughs> we're, we're, that's what we always do. We want to front. We want to we want to post our so-called best life 
on IG. And that posts are real life on IG. Yeah. That, that's what it's coming down to, right? Because with again, we're just a bunch of, of followers. Mm-hmm. And like uh, and like yourself, and like LaFour's a fit, right? She kept on going. She didn't right. bother looking at the numbers. She was like, I don't care about how many people are liking it or not. All I'm right. gonna keep on posting. And something's gonna happen for my consistency and quality of work I'm putting in. And she's putting right. quality of work. Right. Same thing for same thing for you. Right. Because right. it's not just because you can be consistent, but you can be trash. Right. right? It's so it's all about quality of work right and to have the consistency behind it it's about being your authentic self like i don't it's it takes entirely too much energy to try to be somebody else like it's like you got to learn other people's mannerisms and their style like it's it's it's, it's too much like it's, it's kind of too much it's a, it's a lot it's a lot and th- this is where again like what you're doing and what you uh, aspire to do is fantastic because mm-hmm. And it, it, more of that needs to happen. Like you need to affect everybody else, and you're definitely affecting me. Cause I gotta get back and writing my book now. You know, <laughs> I got 23 chapters in. I kind of took a pause. <laughs> you know what I'm so yeah, I'm actually gonna write a novel one day. Um, poetry right now is just the avenue, but at some point a, no- a novel will happen, it's, and I'll be on New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> it, it's it's tough. Let me tell you, man. I'm like I'm going through it, and uh, I'm gonna go the indie route. You know what I'm saying? And uh, it's 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 fun though. I love it. I've been writing this book for eight years, though. <laughs> it is fun. Writing, writing books, they are fun because you you have to you have to think critically, but then at the same time, you can be a little creative and you're formatting and correct. And but then you but it's rewarding because you're giving someone else your baby, and then for them to read it and digest it and tell you, yo, this poem. Like I've had people say to me, Shanae. I've read this poem and oh my gosh, when I hear people say that, I'm like, well, praise God, like that. Hey, well, well, all right, I'm doing something right. No, absolutely, absolutely, you are, because like you know, that's when you know that your your work has been validated, man. Like it's like this is official, like yeah. this is what it is. And like to your point, now you have a residual coming from it. Yeah. You, you did it once. You don't have to touch it again. Yeah. Now you can work on the next project and add to it. Right. And that's what we don't do enough of, right? Like, you know, like, like music, there's a catalog. Right. So if I had a bunch of albums, I could sit for a little bit because that catalog is going to take care of me. Right. And same thing with your poetry, with your website, trying to make that business go, that's going to just keep on coming back to you. So, so as soon as someone finds out about you, first thing <laughs> I'm going to do is let me get that book. Let me get three of those books. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. And that's just residuals hitting you back. But that's, that's how it should be. And, and I love, I love my, my, I have an attitude where I don't want, I don't, I'm not giving you this book to tell, to, for recognition for you to be like, oh, snap, you got my book, girl, post it and tag me. I say that, but in my heart, it's not because I want to keep gaining followers like that. Like, um, one of my, uh, Soros, who is my, a good friend of mine, um, she is Monique's makeup artist, so comedian. Okay. Um, and I, I had given I had said, hey, can you give, I'm going to send you these books from Monique. I'm going to sign them. Can you give them to her? My, I didn't follow that up with and, and tell her to post it and tag me. That wasn't the point. Right. For me, the point was she's going through a lot right now. My poetry could probably be an avenue where she's sitting by herself to say, dang, I needed that. Yeah. Or damn, I needed that. Like, I really needed to hear that. And it, so for me, it's not about getting the public's recognition of girl Monique got my book. A lot of people until I just said that whoever's watching this probably didn't even know that. Right. So for me, it's it's not. And that's where I, I, I love being so humble and the blessing in it because I'm not doing it just to, if one day, say for instance, Erica Campbell gets a hold of me and says, um, I need that girl's book. It's not a matter of Erica post my book on your IG so people can start mm. following. I don't have that mindset. No, absolutely not. It's funny you say that because I don't ask none of my guests to promote the podcast. I, I, mean, I, I don't do that because my whole thing is for me is if you want to, you can. You will. Right, and you will. And the biggest thing too is about gifting. I, this is not my podcast. This is everyone. This is a platform for the people. Right. You know what I'm saying? And that's how I treat my podcast. I, I, that's why I don't call it Giant Nomad's Podcast. I call it Giant Nomad Presents. Right. You know what I'm saying? I'm presenting all these great, fantastic stories from – Everyday people with everyday struggles and everyday successes as well that people don't get to hear about. Because right. we always see the end result. 
we never get to hear how people get to start off. And to your point, you gifted Monique those books. We don't give enough of our of our stuff for free. Right. And we we really want to monetize everything. That's fine. Don't get me wrong. We, yeah, we got to eat. You know what I'm saying? Right. But when you when you give up, you get a lot more back. Right. And I mean, like even like just last week, um, I had met um, this well known radio personality locally. Her name is Melissa Wade. Um, and I had been wanting to meet her, and I finally met her. And she said, "Hey, you have your book?" And I said, "I said I do." Um, I said, "But." I wasn't. I said, honestly, was just about to sign it and give it to you. And she handed me money. And I said, I really wasn't going to ask you for your money. I was just going to sign it and give it to you. And she still gave me her money. And I just appreciated her support. But when I go to well-known people like that, or even or even people who, if I feel like you can only afford one of my books, I'll give you the second one. If the Lord tells me, hey, give her the second one, I'm going to give you the second one. Whether you are famous or not, whether you are somebody um, celebrity wise or not, like I'm just, if it's in my heart, I'm going to give it to you. I've mm-hmm. given my books to people who I, I remember one time I gave it to a, a, a woman in the post office behind the counter and she was like, Oh, thank you so much. And I was like, no problem. Yeah. And I mean, I've been abundantly blessed by that. I've been completely just over the top blessed by that because I, my job, the gospel says that my job is to spread the gospel and it's to give, it's, it's to give people Jesus. If I am the only Jesus that you may see, then I need to be able to conduct myself accordingly. So that's why I am not, I'm, 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 I may be young, I'm almost 30, but I am still not, I'm not a young Christian where I don't know the old traditions, but I'm not so focused on the old traditions that I don't understand the younger generation. Right. Or I don't, I'm not so trying to be down with the younger generation that I disrespect the older generation. What I do for me is if you feel like you want to come have a conversation, let's have an honest conversation. I'm not even, I probably won't even bring up God until God calls me to bring him up because I want you to feel like you're talking to a person, not a walking Bible. Gotcha. I want you to feel sense. like, that's just like, like, like when people come to my podcast, they'll go, is it okay to curse? I say, be yourself. I don't care what you say. Be yourself. Because I'm, it's not for, it's not for me to, to judge you and limit how you speak because that's who you are. So I, I respect the fact that you want to respect me and not disrespecting me, but I respect you enough to want you to be yourself. I don't want you to put on a facade or mask just because you've come into my space. I appreciate the gesture. But be, be yourself. Absolutely. No, you're absolutely right about that. I think that's, that's hard for us to do. Mm-hmm. We, we've, we've, we were, we've, so used to bringing up our, res- our representatives, right? Even right. we go on a we be going on a date, you're not really yourself. <laughs> you bring your representative. Definitely. When you do an interview, you're not being yourself. You're being the person you think you should be. Right. And that's how we were taught, you know. And that's something that we had to unteach ourselves. Mm-hmm. We have to kind of just let that go and say, you know what? I am who I am. Let me be who I am. And no doubt, like there's certain venues you have to be professional. Yeah. There's some, there's some places you can really let your hair down and be, you know, really your true self. And that's not faking the funk. That's right. just knowing where you're at. Right. And that and I remember somebody said to me, you doing poetry or me talking to you is like coming to sit on your sofa. And I said, that's the point. I yeah. want you to come, take your shoes off, take your coat off, take your hat off or whatever you have on your head. Take your ponytail out, let your hair down and get comfortable. Yeah. We're going to get comfortable. We're going to put on a T-shirt. We're going to put on some sweatpants. And we're gonna be comfortable. Yeah. And that's what I want. That that is that is my goal in poetry. It's it, I want to have a conversation. I don't. I'm not talking at you. I'm just speaking. I'm speaking from my heart to re, to reach yours. And if it convicts you, then it convicts you. That's your problem on your end. No, you're right. Like you said, like you know, you're you're really you know just this God sent. You know what I'm saying? Like you really are just with your words, with your wisdom. You know, for for you to have the security about yourself, it's an it's an amazing thing to see, especially when you see that in a, in a strong young black woman like yourself. You know, saying you need to ha- we need to see more of that. Mm-hmm. You know, could we we tend to give more kudos and more airtime to all the ratchet shit? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then you know, right. and then instead of really praising uh, our strong our strong people, that say, hey, you know what? Let's give them more play. 
Yeah. We, we should really give them more attention than the way they should be getting attention. Not 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 the, the ratchet folks that's behind us twerking and shit, and they're getting a fucking million views going viral. Right. You know what I'm saying? And then don't get me wrong, like... So, it, I'm still trying to figure out how... Some, I'm not going to say no names because I don't feel like all the drama, but I don't... I still don't understand how some people are famous. Like, like, I don't understand it. Like, what did you... What did you do that was of substance that makes you famous because it's really it's really the the what's exciting or what's fake now but i don't understand what did you do that was of substance and how in the world is that famous or how does that make you an inspiration what is that well that's the thing well when it comes down to fame those things you just described doesn't go with it you know what i'm saying that's a totally different outfit you know to be famous is to be a caricature of something. Right. You know what I'm saying? And you're not even really being your true self. Right. And then the few people who are themselves, whether no matter what industry they're in, that seem to always be the underdog. Right. Because they are their true selves. And they're always grinding, grinding, grinding. And then the people who are willing to show out and and just go over the top tend to get gravitate the most attention. It's like a car accident. You know what I'm saying? You see a crack inside the road that's rubbernecking all the way, right? Right. No one's paying attention to the road. Because yeah. Because they're looking, trying to figure out what happened, and all of a sudden you're in traffic. Exactly, man. It's it's amazing. Like you're you're dope, for real. And you you just stay that way, you know. And like keep on teaching other folks. Like keep on doing what you're doing. I'm a huge fan of yours. I already oh. am. I'm, I'm gonna be your, your biggest cheerleader. You watch and see, like. Because oh, this is the whole purpose of this, you know what I'm saying? To get more people like ourselves seen and heard, and and put on on a, on a platform where they can be seen and heard, and this could be used over and over again, you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. we we don't have enough of that for ourselves, right? And if we do, we're using we're doing it the wrong way, right? Definitely, I you know agree. But thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. Now, let everyone know how they can find you, where they can buy your books, everything. Okay, so you can find me on, I feel like I have a million names. I say this all the time. <laughs> so my Facebook is Sinead Urquhart. My mom gave me a name that can't nobody spell. My husband gave me a name that can't nobody say. So I am a double whammy <laughs> on both ends. You're a I, double negative? <laughs> hilarious. That's why I always say it. So my name on Facebook is Sinead Urquhart. That's C H E N A E. Last name is Urquhart, E R K E R D. Um, my website is I am C L E the artist.com. My um, Instagram and YouTube is also I am C L E the artist. Um, I think that's it. I need to tweet. I need to start tweeting. That's start tweeting. Told yeah, absolutely. Someone told me I need to start tweeting. So I'm going to start tweeting. I, I, have a, I have a Twitter. It's three. The number three cover cover me, and then the number seven. But so I'll change it. You might want to change that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be so sure that, but you might want to change it. that, yeah. It's been so long since I've been on Twitter. It's been years since I've been on Twitter. So I'll change it and I'll re rebuild a Twitter. But that is how you can find me. I am Coe the artist on Instagram and YouTube and www.imcoetheartist.com. And for booking. You can email info I am C O E the artist at gmail.com. And awesome. that is and how what about your books? What's the name of your books? My books are uh vent, like a vent in the ceiling. Vent the different faces of me. Um and the second one is called I Almost Held On. You can find those on Amazon as well as my website. If you order it on Amazon, it comes from Amazon, of course. If you order it from my website, it comes directly from me, and that way you'll have my signature. This was a blast. I had a lot of fun with you today. Thank you. Hey, everybody. <laughs> this is Giant Nomad Presents. And today we presented Janae. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one. Talk to you soon. Bye. -bye. Bye.